joined now by Ben Weber, President and CEO of Sociometric Solutions. Ben, thanks so much for being with us. Great to be here. Uh, what is a sociometric badge, I ask, yes. as one is presumably dangling around your neck? Right? Yeah, right, so that's exactly what this is. Um, so the sociometric badge, I mean, you can think of it as a replacement for a company ID badge. Right? So most company ID badges, they already have a sensor in them, the RFID, right? And that's what you used to tap into doors and everything. But the idea is that, you know, that's a sensor. So if I put little RFID readers in the ceiling, you can figure out where people are. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't tell you a lot about how happy people are, how productive they are. Um, and so what we've done is we've created, um, added some additional sensors to these ID badges to look at who talks to who and how people talk to each other. And not what they say, but in real time doing voice analysis. So you're looking at your tone of voice, you know, your volume modulation, how quickly you talk. Um, you combine that with data from infrared so I can see who's facing each other. Uh, Bluetooth scans tell you uh, sort of who's around you, where you are. Uh -huh. um, An accelerometer tells you what your posture is like, how much you're moving around. And we combine that data with data from email, IM, phone calls, so we get this complete view of how people are collaborating. So what types of observations or conclusions are you able to make from that data? So there's a lot. I mean, we've gone to dozens of organizations, typically we work with larger companies. We'll go mm -hmm. and we have thousands of these badges, and we'll go in and deploy it across the entire company. And what we'll look at is how do these patterns relate to the outcomes you care about, productivity, job mm -hmm. satisfaction. Um, and so a lot of the big things that you see, for example, is how important it is to have a very tight-knit face-to-face network. That if you have a sort of small group of people that you commiserate with and you can talk with a lot, who also talk a lot to each other, mm -hmm. across many different industries, that turns out to be very important. And there's a few reasons for that. So one is that just from a social perspective, you, know, you have a very supportive group around you. And so if you have a problem and one of your friends finds out, then everyone will know and be able to support you very quickly. Mm -hmm. On the actual sort of job side of it, it's also very helpful because now if you're talking about very complex stuff, we're all on the same page. So I don't have to constantly fill people in yeah. about what's going on. At the same time, what you also want to have is some of your connections, and some of this can be through email and more electronic channels, is you need to have this diverse group of people that you can reach out to. And that's how you get new ideas. Mm -hmm. right? And this idea that you know, if you talk to a lot of people all the time, even if I ask them for their opinion about something, they all essentially have the same opinion because we're working off of the same information. It's when you talk to somebody who's from a very different social group, you know, who you don't normally talk to, who's, who runs in different circles, uh -huh. those guys are going to give you a unique take and help you think up new ideas. But in different industries and in different jobs, we have to figure out how to balance those things. Um, and a lot of what we look at is across industries and across different jobs, how, how, do you, how should you shift that balance? What results from the data have surprised you? Yeah, so we've had a, a bunch of very interesting results. Um, and one of, one of them is really how important physical space is. And it's interesting because hmm. you think about email, for example, right? And technologically, I could email anybody in the world, right? And just, you know, tap their email address and they can do it. But it turns out that even your email is, you're, you're much more likely to email somebody who sit, sits next to you than somebody who sits on another floor. No kidding. And not even if they're on the same team, even if organization, yeah. they're the they're the same, um, they're in the same group. Um, it doesn't matter. There's actually great work. The work that we've done, work out of University of Toronto, that looked at people who are randomly assigned seats, and it just turns out that that's that you bump into people more, you also tend to email them more. And what's interesting is that it's not just sort of where you sit, but even things seemingly as trivial as you know where the coffee machine is, where the water cooler is, has huge strong power. Probably the most interesting one, you know, that we didn't expect, comes from a cafeteria of a large online travel company. And what we were noticing is that people who ate in larger lunch groups turned out to be a lot more productive. Um, basically, <laughs> if you ate in a large lunch group, you ate with about 12 people. Yeah. There were some groups that turned out to be about 12 people, some groups that were closer to four. People eating in the lunch groups that were about 12 people, they were much more likely to talk to those people later in the week. And as a consequence, you got a better view sort of into the code they were working on and the other things they were doing. And it turned out those guys were a lot more productive. And we were trying to figure out, well, why are people sitting in these different sized groups? Because it was pretty consistent. You saw a bunch of 12-person groups and a bunch of four-person groups, and why is that? And it turned out that just some of the tables at the cafeteria fit 12 people and some fit four. And again, so it's a very trivial decision. You think about that, that's not something that CEOs are traditionally thinking about but actually had a huge impact, double-digit yeah. impact on performance. And so 
this idea that physical space is actually a huge tool that we're not thinking about strategically, I think was this really interesting thing that we That's were really learning. interesting. Yeah. Last question for you. Sure. Do you anticipate, you know, as these things do, that these yeah. badges are going to get smaller or perhaps yeah. even merge yeah. with another device, merge with a smartphone? So they're going to definitely merge with ID badges. Um, in the very near future, these are just going to be your ID badges. Mm -hmm. With your cell phone, there's some difficulty there. Because actually, your cell phone has a lot of the same sensors in it already, right? The issue is it's in your pocket, okay? So because it's in your pocket, I, uh, I can't see who you're talking to. I can do proximity scanning, and actually there's a lot of good work. Um, there's another spin-off out of MIT by Havio that does sort of this sensor data uh, mm -hmm. research. And what they found is that over a three-month period, I can figure out who your friends are, um, I can figure out um, your stress level and some other things. But it turns out that just your proximity, just those patterns, especially at work, don't relate to how happy you are or how productive you are. And so if you were, wore a cell phone around your neck and you were able to get some directionality there as well from the compass, for example, you could do the same sort of things. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot more expensive than an ID card, which mm -hmm. people already have at work. Um, and it's also something where, again, unless you're going to wear it in that way and it's a lot heavier than this badge, sure. <laughs> then it, you know, it's not going to be like that. Maybe, you know, maybe yeah. there's other things with wearables that, that do eventually turn into this, like a Google Glass type thing or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe that does sort of turn into, I mean, just the ID badge of the future. Sure. And well, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate you taking here. the time. Yeah.